Andrew Stoller is a consultant on international trade and investment issues. Before relocating to Australia, he was the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization based in Washington. He's speaking at a conference this week organized by the American Chamber of Commerce in Australia and the United States Study Center. It'll celebrate the 10th anniversary of the free trade agreement between Australia and the US. He's in our Adelaide studio. Andrew Stoller, very warm welcome to Late Line. Good evening, Emma. Given you also serve on the advisory committee of the European Centre for International Political Economy, I thought I'd start with Greece. There'll now be a referendum on Sunday to decide whether or not to accept the terms laid out by the country's lenders. That's essentially a vote on whether or not to stay in the euro, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. And, you know, the, the real tragedy here, Emma, is that... Uh, Greece never should have been in the euro, and uh, having made a mess of their finances that they did over the past few years, they've basically squandered the past five years since the bailout efforts uh, started. To give you an example, at the start of the bailout effort, uh, they promised to unload about $50 billion in state-owned assets, uh, and over five years they've only managed to sell off $2 billion. Free movement of capital is fundamental to the monetary union and with capital controls having been imposed on Greece, the public only allowed to withdraw up to 60 euros a day, banks closed for at least a week. They're effectively already out of the euro, aren't they? I think so, yes. Is what we're seeing in Greece evidence that austerity has failed? No. If you look at what happened in, um, in Spain and Ireland, uh, two other countries in the eurozone who had uh, similar problems a few years ago, they actually undertook uh, reforms that were necessary to get them back on track, and they're doing a lot better now than uh, the Greeks are. As I say, the Greeks wasted the last five years. Although it's arguable whether Spain has really turned a corner given their unemployment rate, the economy is still fairly stuck in the doldrums. Well, it's true, and, it, and even in Ireland, they haven't got back to where they were, but it, they have made a lot more progress than the Greeks have made. So moving to so-called free trade, it's almost 10 years since we signed an agreement with the United States. What tangible benefits has that FTA delivered for Australia? Well, I think it's interesting. If you go back to 2002, Mark Vale, who was a trade minister at the time, made a speech in which he described what Australia's objectives were for the agreement beyond simply uh, opening markets. And the four things that he listed were increasing American investment into Australia, which would bring about productivity gains in this country. Uh, secondly, to increase the integration of the Australian and American business communities. Thirdly, to use the U.S.-Australian agreement as a, a form of competitive liberalization to encourage others to move forward with market opening. And finally, to put the U.S. and Australia in a leadership role in uh, prosperity and security in the Asia-Pacific. And if you judge the uh, American-Australian agreement against those four objectives that Mark Vial outlined back in 2002, it's been a tremendous success. I would argue it's also been a success on the trade liberalization front. But if you look at what's happened in investment in particular, uh, the investment from the United States into Australia is what has made Australia a powerhouse in the Asia-Pacific region. What, ha what, what level of uh, increase have we seen in the past decade? Oh, it's been exponential. American investment in Australia at the moment is 27% uh, of all foreign investment in Australia. It's about $650 billion. If you compare that to Chinese investment in Australia, for example, Chinese have only invested about $65 billion compared to $650 billion from the U.S. Would that investment have come regardless of the FTA? Uh, it's hard to say. You know, the FTA did liberalize the investment climate into Australia from the United States by raising FERB limits and things like that. Uh, but also, I think there was a demonstration effect. Uh, the, the companies that were making the investments felt that uh, they had an investment welcoming environment. President Obama, as we now know, has been given the right to fast-track negotiations on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Is it obvious to you that there will be clear benefits for Australia in that deal? Yes, and here I think it's important. Uh, I heard earlier in your program people talking about the sugar industry and all that. It's be a mistake to focus on issues like that because the Trans-Pacific Partnership is really an agreement uh, being negotiated which is much more about the behind-the-border problems that businesses face in the 21st century. 
things like lack of regulatory coherence, different product standards, different intellectual property rules, different investment rules, discrimination in services provision. None of these things are traditional border issues, and they're really what is at the heart of modern trade agreements like the TPP. And the TPP 12 who are doing this deal now are the ones who are basically writing the rules for the future. The Productivity Commission has questioned the value of free trade agreements generally, which it doesn't even call free, it calls them preferential trade agreements. Its biggest criticism is around the secrecy that's attached to these, uh, well specifically to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because that's what we're talking about right now. It is hard to properly analyse this deal given there's very little we know about it. Well, to be fair to the negotiators, every time they have a negotiating session, they set aside one day in which anybody who has any questions about the direction of the negotiations in a particular area of concern to them can come and meet with the negotiators and, under, and try to get an understanding of what's happening. Now, they don't share the text, and I, that is a bit of a problem, but uh, to the extent that they're telling the truth about what they're trying to do, it is possible to find out the direction they're going in. By the way, let me just say, uh, I had the unfortunate experience of being associated with a Productivity Commission study of regional and free trade agreements several years ago, and I was forced to write a dissenting opinion because uh, the people in the Productivity Commission don't really understand these agreements. That's very harsh, given they assess them quite regularly. The only thing they assess, Emma, is the market aspect, uh, the market opening aspects by lowering tariffs because that's the only thing that the economics profession is capable of doing these days. And when tariffs aren't the important question, when you're dealing with the issues like investment services and other issues that the economists at the Productivity Commission can't measure, they fall back on what was a, uh, an idea adopted about 70 years ago in terms of how you look at free trade agreements, and it's not really valid anymore. Well, economists are trained to look at opportunity costs, for instance, and according to the Productivity Commission, the Japan-Korean agreements were concluded without a rigorous and independent assessment of whether the costs would exceed benefits. Emma, this is one of the, this is one of the issues that I disagreed with the Productivity Commission on, because if they can't measure, if they don't have the tools to make those kind of measurements, it's not exactly a uh, fair game to insist that you have to make those measurements before you decide whether the agreement is a good one or not. Well, the other troubling part of the TPP is the Investor State Dispute Settlement Clause, where companies can sue governments for full compensation for a reduction in their expected profits that result from a country's regulations. And this is more than just a academic uh, risk for Australia because we're already in the midst of our first investor state dispute with Philip Morris Asia, the tobacco company, which is challenging the tobacco plane packaging legislation. So this is a very real risk for Australia, isn't it, and our sovereignty? Well, Australia just concluded a free trade agreement with China that has investor state dispute settlement in it. Australia concluded a, a free trade agreement with Korea that has investor state dispute settlement in it. And if you look at what Australia did in both of those agreements, and which I expect Australia to do again in the TPP context, is to make sure that certain areas are uh, ruled off limits for investor state dispute settlement. For example, health uh, measures and the sort of thing that was done in plain packaging. But the plain packaging issue has come to represent quite a real threat. Well, that's what some people call regulatory chill. And, uh, you know, that, that suggests that a government might be afraid to do certain things because they might get sued later on. Um, as, I, as I said, if you are careful about how you word your free trade agreement and your investor state dispute settlement provisions, you shouldn't have that problem in areas that are important to you. OK, is the real intention of this Trans-Pacific Partnership to contain China? No, create a sort of formidable not. block to counteract its economic strength in this region? No, absolutely not. And in fact, the TPP without China won't be a very good agreement. I mean, the idea is right now there are a couple of countries, there are a couple of regions and economies in the Asia Pacific who are not in TPP. China is one of them. Korea is another one. Um, Taiwan is an economy that should be part of an eventual TPP. Indonesia. Uh, what's going on right now is not an attempt to contain China. It's an attempt to get a good agreement negotiated that others can then want to join. And China's not the only one. As I say, the Koreans have already put up their hand and say they want to be in TPP, but they've been told, wait until the deal is done. 
Now, the Chinese uh, will probably only eventually join the TPP if they see that it is useful for them in helping them bring about further reforms to their domestic economy. And it may be, for example, that the, um, the state-owned enterprise rules that are being negotiated in the TPP might actually be something that's attractive to the Chinese authorities. Andrew Stoller, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thanks for coming in for us. Thank you very much.